In today's video, we're looking at what Jesus meant when he said it's easier for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Did he mean all rich people will go to hell? We'll find out. But most importantly, we're going to talk about how you can be sure you are going to heaven and will spend eternity with Jesus. My name is Lee. Welcome to my channel, your online resource for growing in confidence as a believer. Let's dive into it. So what did Jesus mean when he said it's easier for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than for a wealthy person to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Did he mean that people with any amount of money are unlikely to make it into the kingdom of heaven? How can you and I be sure we will make it into heaven? Well, the answer isn't that complicated. It's in part found right in the text. And in another part, it's found in a single first century Near Eastern belief, which was Jesus's audience. So we have to take that into consideration. But to kick things off, let's just start by diving right into the text. Okay, so we're going to begin our journey by looking at Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 27. Let's just begin reading here. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him, knelt before him, and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I want you to note that the beginning of this particular story is about inheriting eternal life. That is the question being presented by the rich young ruler. And so everything that the author will write next in this story centers around eternal life. This entire story is about the means to inheriting eternal life. So try to keep that in mind as we go forward. That will serve us well. Verse 18, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now what's happening here? This is wild. Is Jesus denying his deity? No, absolutely not. But this is a much deeper conversation for another video. So what I want you to do is keep an eye out for the end screen or for a video link to pop up right here in the coming days with a separate video where I'm going to go all in much deeper on this specific issue. But for now, let's just keep reading on to verse 19. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Now I want to stop here and make mention. Jesus is speaking to a culture of people who believe that the way you inherit salvation is through keeping the law, the Torah, the 600 plus laws that was given at Mount Sinai to Moses. Okay. And so the question being presented to Jesus by a, a man who is a Orthodox Jew who believes in keeping the law to inherit salvation, Jesus is just answering according to the man's current beliefs, but it's all about to be challenged. Verse 20, and he said to him, teacher, I've kept all of these things from my youth up. Verse 21, looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go sell all of your possessions. So all you possess, give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, this is a major hint right here. This verse gives a big clue into the answer to all of our questions. Now, I want you to notice this. I'm not going to tell you fully because I'm not going to spoil it this early, but I will say this. Notice that giving away of all of his possessions was not the thing that he lacked. It was just the obstacle in the way of achieving the thing he lacked that Jesus is referring to here. That's a huge hint, huge hint, but let's keep reading the story here and I'll wrap back around to that in just a minute. But at these words, he was saddened and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. Jesus looking around said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Now notice what happens here. Watch the disciples' reaction. And we have a couple questions we need to ask about how they react that will shed some light onto what Jesus was getting at. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Now, notice the shift. First, Jesus is saying how hard it is for wealthy people, a rich man, to enter the kingdom of God. And then he just goes and says, arbitrarily, it's just hard to enter the kingdom of God, period. Okay, now verse 25. 
It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Now this question right here and the reaction of the disciples ought to be sending question marks running through our mind. Why was this their response? If a rich man can't be saved and it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, then who can be saved? Why did they think that way? That's going to be an important question for us moving forward. But verse 27, looking at them, Jesus said, with people, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, what is the subject of this story? Inheriting eternal life. We talked about that at the very beginning. The author set us up with that information. So we know when Jesus says, with man, it is impossible. What is impossible? Inheriting eternal life. But with God, all things are possible. What's the subject of the possibility here? inheriting eternal life. Let's keep that in mind as we move forward. So why did the disciples find themselves amazed and perplexed at Jesus's statement that it's hard for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of heaven? Why was their response, then who can enter the kingdom of heaven? As if to say, if the wealthy person can't, or it's hard or nearly impossible for the wealthy person to enter the kingdom of heaven, who can then enter the kingdom of heaven? Why was this their response? Why wasn't their response more of a response that we have here in the West? Maybe you have a, a pastor in mind who has four yachts and three private jets. All the while, there's people in their church houses that can barely put food on the table. In our minds, we think of these particular kinds of people. And so part of us is kind of like, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that a wealthy person, they're wrapped up in their greed. They're, they're wrapped up in their money. And so it makes sense that it's going to be hard for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of God. I mean, I guess we could kind of interpret it that way. So why didn't the disciples take it that way? Because it wasn't very different in their day and age. I mean, matter of fact, a lot of the wealth that was created in their day and age was due to stepping on the backs of poor people. Take tax collectors, for instance. Why do people hate Zacchaeus so much or the apostle Matthew? They were tax collectors because they robbed from their own people, essentially, and they got paid really well for it. And so why didn't the disciples have this particular view in mind that we in the West have? The problem is we're completely wrong. The reason that the disciples were so perplexed comes from a very popular first century Near Eastern belief. They believed that wealth was a sign of God's blessing and approval in your life, especially when you have a guy like this, a rich young ruler who presumably did not get rich off of the backs of other people and was greatly concerned about doing good. We can see that at the very beginning of the narrative. He approaches Jesus and, and basically is saying, all of these commandments I've kept and I've abided by, they're very important to me. So we can assume that this particular wealthy person did not get rich from greed and from stepping on the backs of poor people or their countrymen. They genuinely love God and want to please him. So in the eyes of the disciples, they're assuming that this man is blessed, approved, and favored by God. And if he's having trouble getting into heaven, how can anyone else? And this is precisely the position that Jesus wants to get his disciples. And this story is happening in the midst of a culture who believe salvation is inherited by faithfully fulfilling the 600 plus laws in the Torah. They believe that they actually have somewhat of a variable amount of control over their own eternal salvation. And what Jesus is trying to do is get them in a position where all of that is being questioned. Now notice the young man approached Jesus and says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And it's precisely this issue that Jesus is getting at. He's saying, you can't do anything to inherit eternal life, whether you're rich or poor, you're nameless or you're famous, whether you keep all of the Torah or some of the Torah, you can do nothing. With man, it is impossible. What is impossible? Inheriting eternal life. In other words, Jesus was suggesting indirectly that God was going to make a way for humankind to inherit eternal life that existed beyond keeping the 600 plus laws in Torah. He was pointing to himself in a veiled kind of a way that no one understood at the time, but would later. So now the question becomes, why did Jesus say wealthy people specifically in his example? would have a harder time entering the kingdom than a camel entering the eye of a needle. 
Well, remember how I mentioned in verse 21 that there was a particular hint? Let's look back at it now. It says, looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go sell all you possess, give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. Here's the hint. You see, if we're not careful when we read this verse, we may associate this phrase down here that says, you lack one thing. Go and sell all you possess, give to the poor. As somehow him becoming not wealthy is his ticket into heaven. That's not what Jesus is getting at at all. What does that actually do? Jesus tells us what giving everything away to the poor accomplishes, and it's not eternal life. It's just that he'll have treasure in heaven. It says that right here. What gets him into heaven is the follow me part. And that leads us into how can we be sure that we will be in heaven and spend eternity with Jesus. So selling all of his possessions and giving to the poor was not what would have gotten him into heaven. It was just an obstacle that stood in the way from what would have gotten him into heaven. And maybe it's an obstacle that stands in your way and in my way. And it's an area of our life we really need to examine what obstacles are in our way from keeping us from the very thing that gets us into heaven and spending eternal life with Christ. Well, first we have to ask what gets us into heaven and spends eternal life with Christ? Well, we know it has to do with following Jesus, but let's be a little bit more specific. First, we can find the answer in Romans 10 verse 9 and 10. So let's take a look at that now. It says, That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, in other words, you confess that Jesus is Lord of your life, that means he's your, your teacher, he's not just your God, but he's your teacher, you follow his teachings, you follow his commands, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. Believe in Jesus and that God raised him from the dead and confess these things with your mouth. But I would also add to that, your lifestyle should change and the fruit of your life should reflect what you genuinely believe. So how can you be sure that you will have eternal life? It is as simple as believing in Jesus, making him Lord of your life, following him, his teachings, his commands. And that's what the heart of this story is with the rich young ruler. It's a young man who thought he could earn eternal life. And Jesus was saying, no, you can't earn it. It's simply only a gift from God and made possible by God. So I hope that this video has been helpful for you. I hope that it's brought clarity surrounding the often confused story of the rich young ruler. But most of all, I hope that today you are confident in your eternal salvation in Christ. If you made that decision for the first time to follow Christ, would you let us know in the comments so we can all celebrate with you. But anyway, I hope that this has been encouraging for you. I hope it's brought clarity and I hope it's boosted your confidence as a believer. And until next time, as always, God bless.